Um, if anyone wants to know why this is a big deal, there is an entire web uh, page called IHateCoordinateSystems.com. You can read up on all kinds of problems that you run into and in trying to bring in and work data systems, uh, data from different providers of from different sources from different communities and put them together. So um, I would say this is a useful read. If you have trouble with your data set when you're trying to work with a data set for the first time, go look at this web page. The source of your problem will be listed somewhere on this page. The most common issues, at least. Okay, so let's talk about raster data and map projection. So in this notebook, uh, we will talk about converting uh, data from one projection system uh, to another. Why is this important? Like I said, um, uh, different people produce data on different map projections. Some people like UTM, some people like LATLON. SRTM is in LATLON, but Landsat is, is in UTM. So you, if you want to bring SRTM data into the Landsat space, you have to transform it. So it's a very common operation. Um, in, we will walk through examples of reprojecting geocoded rasters. And we'll also talk about reprojecting SWATH data, which could be of use to, to uh, radar operations for us. So uh, the, node, the data sets are exactly the same. You don't need to rerun um, these cells if you already have these data sets. Uh, don't run the cell if you've already linked it correctly to a correct folder. We'll start with the, the same Python utilities. So anything to do with maps is accomplished via GDAL warp. So GDAL translate, GDAL info, which is focus of the first notebook, GDAL translate, which is the focus of the second notebook, and GDAL warp, which is the focus of this notebook, are pretty much the workhorses under QGIS. Anything you do with QGIS, anything you do with Google Earth Engine, these are the three workhorses that are working under the hood for you. Any, uh, in, in, in any GIS system, pretty much. So GDAL warp focuses on taking data in one projection system and resampling and reprojecting it into another system in the sa at the same time, converting formats, converting types, and so on. So there's a lot to, to um, lot of options like you can see. We will talk about the most common options in, in this notebook. The most common thing we always want to do is, is coordinate transformation. The, the most commonly used coordinate systems in, in the SAR world are listed here, 4326. EPSG is the European Petroleum Standards Group. They basically got uh, sick of people uh, producing data on different map systems, and they basically assigned unique integers to say, if you say your data is that is in that projection system, that's completely defined. You know the transformations from it to other systems. So 4326 is, is, is the most commonly used, and it and it's, uh, uh, represents the LATLON system on a WGS84 website. 3031 is the Antarctic uh, uh, polar stereo system. 3413 is the Arctic polar stereo system. And anything between 32600 to 32660 represents the standard UTM in the north. That's what Landsat uses. 32700 to 32760 is, is what's in the uh, southern hemisphere. Again, what Landsat Sentinel-2 um, uses. So just to quickly uh, 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 be clear about this. These uh, numbers represent the horizontal position in space. They don't know anything about the vertical. You could be at any height. Uh, when you when you give these numbers, these are horizontal datums. Um, one quick way of uh, checking this, or GDAL comes with a command line utility called GDAL transform. Uh, in this case, what I'm asking it to do is I'm asking it to transform SSRS is the source, uh, a TSRS is the destination. So I'm asking it to take data that is provided in LATLON space 
and report its uh, its value in the polar stereo uh, arctic space so always remember this command line utility takes x and y as the order so the lawn comes first so i'm giving it a lawn of minus 45 and latitude of 90 degrees and we know the not this is the north pole uh, longitude doesn't matter at north pole if your latitude is 90 degrees and uh, that is the center of your polar stereo system. So if you, you should, if you run this command, you should see a zero being printed out because that essentially represents the origin of the polar stereo system. If you want to go the other way, you could just uh, flip the source and the destination and again provide the x, y, which is zero, zero. And it should give you uh the the origin of the polar CEO system this was a way to do it in, on command line for single points but in in our work we do a lot of transformations you given a shape file in latlon you want to transform it to another you want to iterate over points and do it again and again we've included a programmatic um, method of, of doing this uh, please pay attention to this these two lines where the OSR OAMS traditional GIS order needs to be set. This ensures that any input and any output, the order is X, Y, always X, Y. So always set these two settings and as, then you can safely assume in your code that the order is X, Y for your Python calls. So in this case, we're just creating simple transformers for one projection system to another. Uh, run the cell. This will set up the transformer code. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm setting up a transformer from latlon to Antarctic Polar Stereo. And once I have this, then I just have a function that I can call on whatever I want to to uh, in my Python code. Uh, how do you see these commands? What do you mean by that? Ah, sorry, okay. All right, so this lets you create two Python objects and then you can use this Python object wherever you want in your code to transform points whenever you want it. Uh, here is an uh, example uh, that I did by uh, creating a transformer between that lawn and UTM 11 North. You can go to this web page and plug in these coordinate systems and make sure that the values of the transformation um, comes back the same. So these for this lawn and this lat, this were the X and Y as computed from the calculator above, and these are the numbers that come out of our codes. The calculator on the web page is, is truncates it to a few digits. That's why you don't see the, the full details. The other thing which is really important for radar processing is the vertical transformation. So the horizontal representation of where a point is, is decoupled from where it is in the height domain. So the, the height domain is, uh, is represented with, with a vertical datum. Uh, there are very standard geoids that get used. For example, when you look at the original SRTM data, they are on EGM-96 geoid. The way you represent EGM-96, the EPSG code for that is 5773. Uh, and uh, for uh, EGM08 is 3885. For EGM96 is probably still the most widely used geoid. Uh, the way to check uh, uh, to combine a horizontal datum with a vertical datum is by combining the horizontal datum number with uh, the vertical representation. So. Um, when you do that, you will see that this is a compound CRS and it identifies it as WGS84 plus EGM96 height. Uh, you can also quickly, if you want to transform a point to its ellipsoid height, quick question to this class, why are we transforming things to ellipsoid height? We know the SRTM data is on the EGM 96, so the coastline is zero in SRTM data. Why are we making the transformation? If you remember your uh, notebooks from Stipmap app and Topsap, 
you will see the DEM have a .wgsid4 extension. We've taken the original DEM and we've made it height with respect to WGSID4 ellipsoid. Why do we need to go through that process? Can anybody think of an answer? Uh, could you elaborate on that? Um, okay. Hi, yeah. I, I wasn't really able to type fast enough. Um, I assume that they wanted it to be like a flat earth because if you have uh, geoid heights, it can kind of mess with the like incidence angles and like the expectation of like the smooth surface. That is, that is correct. Uh, an ellipsoid is a clearly analytically defined surface. So when you're trying to do geometry computations, you can solve for things on an ellipsoid a lot more quickly. Then if you have to look up the geoid height at every point and adjust your computation for every computation you make. So the very first thing that happens is we bring the height to height with respect to an ellipsoid. So you can also quickly uh, see, I'm, I've taken a point, I think this is Santa Monica somewhere on the pier, and, if, uh, and it's on the coast, it's on the ocean. So height is zero. If I were to um, transform it, and ask uh, it to tell me what the height about the ellipsoid was, it's actually minus 36 meters. So if you were to uh, plot the elevation of California on an ellipsoid, California coast would roughly be 30 meters, 30 odd meters below the ellipsoid. So this is the height we would be using for all our radar computations. Um, if you have a DEM, why does I say correcting? Oh, that's because the program can either add or subtract. I think the default option is to add, whereas we add it with the, uh, the default action, uh, the default uh, option is to subtract, which is go from WGS84 to geoid. I think we flip the switch and say, add it back but I think the, the printouts to the screen just stay the, stay the same. It's a plus one or minus one flag that gets passed into add or subtract in the ICE module. Um, if you have a DEM, uh, in this case, uh, we had a D, we had this, uh, we downloaded the WGS84 heights already from open topography. If we want to convert it to EGM-96, we don't need any special modules anymore. The, uh, the module in ICE is, is when these things were not available in GDAL. Now it's a simple command line uh, call with GDAL, with this particular uh, specific GDAL call. This will take out the, uh, the geoid and make it, uh, this will take out the geoid and bring it to EGM-96 heights. So run this uh, cell. And when you plot it, well, uh, oh, I think I flipped the axis. Maybe that, that's a bug. Yeah, so on the left is the ellipsoid height, the original image. This is the corrected with respect to EGM-96 image, and this is the difference between the uh, EGM-96 and the, and, the, and the ellipsoid uh, uh, difference, the difference between the two. So uh, we can totally uh, handle bringing in DEMs and vertical datum shifts purely with GDAL warp in this case. Any questions about horizontal datum versus vertical datum? This becomes more and more important from point of geodesy. Uh, if you're just doing optical imagery or if you're just aligning data like field data on, on, on to your processed INSAR products, the vertical datum doesn't really matter. It mostly impacts only the DEMs that you bring in. Oh, that was just this. Uh, let me put it back. I don't think you need you need the uh, um, 
I was just trying to play with the label. Uh, I think I applied the EGM96 label wrong. This should be where this should be. So one is the original, one is the adjusted, and this is the, the geoid difference. Okay, if there are no questions about uh, datum transformations. The next step, what we're going to do is we're gonna take data and take geocoded rasters, which means that they have a, the imagery has a has map information associated with it and, and reproject it. Uh, the simplest way to reproject is to say, I want this image to be in the destination uh, coordinate system, and that's it. And then uh, you have not specified any spacing and so on. JDAO will try to find the best common spacing to use and, and, and do this. So let's run this. Let's plot this data. So this was the original Greenland DEM that was in polar stereo space. And this is the, since I asked it in Latlon space, this is the same data in Latlon space. And since I did not specify any spacing and so on, uh, GDAL determined the best uh, size it should try to resize it to and made that decision itself. However, you can control the exact uh, 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 output spacing. So the question is, uh, how, what was the question? How do you plot no data as background? Uh, yeah, I think we just set it to zero in this case. I don't think we did anything fancy in this plotting routine. I think here you can read the no data value and set it to nan or or, or play with the, uh, uh, yeah. If you do that in the load data function, then this would be, this no data would show up as, yeah, I, I just didn't do that manipulation in this case. Uh, so you're also able to specify exact output spacing, spacing in X and spacing in Y so is the order in which you specify this. So here I'm saying I want 0, 0.0 degrees in, in lawn and 0, 0.01 degrees in, in lab. Once I do that, I, did I skip a cell? Unexpected. Must have introduced a typo somewhere. Yep. Yeah, so here you see the output came out to be more equally spaced. Uh, this is because latitude and longitude, relative latitude and longitude spacings change as a function of latitude. That's one of the problems with the lateral space. Uh, another very useful thing is resampling to a predefined grid. What do I mean by this? So if you, you can ha just get a whole bunch of images which are slightly offset from each other. Um, you can, uh, for example, if you look at Landsat data, the pixels are always uh, aligned with a multiple of 30 meters. Uh, so whereas if you take data in, in Latlon space and drip, project it to, to overlap on your Landsat imagery, uh, how do you guarantee that the pixels where it resamples lines up with the 30 meter grid that you have? So one option is uh, that uh, GDAL provides, it's called the uh, pixel aligned uh, option. Where Yeah, so let's first run the, the uh, resampling without a uh, pixel alignment. So when you look at the output of this, you will see that the origin, which is the top left, is has all these weird decimal places, whereas the pixel spacing is clearly 100 meters because you asked it to to um, produce 100 meter pixels. What if you wanted these uh, 
origin, the top corner to be a nice multiple of your pixel spacing. Uh, so all you would do is add the minus tap option to your uh, GDAL warp command. This is extremely important when you're trying to align uh, data sets at a very high resolution on top of each other. And now when you run the uh, GDAL info on the align subset, you will, you will see that the origin is a nice neat multiple of 100 meters. Uh, and you will be able to put all these data sets with that option on the same spacing to line up right on top of each other. So that's simple reprojection uh, of, of one image to another. The last thing I want to talk about is, is uh, reprojecting SWOT data. SWOT data is, is again, as, uh, imagery is a simple 2D array. In a, in a geocoded data set, the images, the axes are aligned with the north and the east axis or lat and lawn or, or two, two clearly well-defined axes. Uh, but SWAT data, they are not aligned, not, they are not on a map. Uh, each pixel has a separate lat lawn, but they're not on a map. Um, the very simple way of doing, uh, working with those kinds of data sets, uh, especially over oceans where, where there is no topography, is, is to use ground control points. So if you were to download any Sentinel-1 GRD product or SLC product, and if you were to run GDAL info on, on the product, you could do this on the downloaded SLCs from, from uh, yesterday's example. Uh, if you were to point to a TIFF file within that, um, you will see a whole bunch of uh, a screen output like this. It, it's, it will basically say uh, GCP zero is zero, zero to that. What this means, this is, this is pixel zero, uh, line zero mapped to longitude, latitude, so there's a, a very coarse lookup table from a pixel location in the imagery to a geophysical location. And this, these, this, these are called ground control points. Um, you can see the heights here are very, very similar. So in, in many applications, uh, like say sea ice applications or, or like oil sleek applications, this uh, GCPs are more than enough to geocode your data. Um, they're not geodesy grade, uh, but they're enough to geocode your data within 10 meters easily. And the way to do it is you can just point, just use GDAL warp uh, to, um, with exact same options at your SWAT data. And the GDAL will see that, oh, there's geocoded, uh, there's ground control points associated with your imagery, and it's not a map uh, geocoded product. So I'm going to use the ground control points to, to um, geocode the imagery. Uh, like I said, this again works best in super flat terrain or, or in oceans where topography really doesn't that ma matter that much uh, because it's not doing a pixel by pixel lookup with the DEM. It's just fitting a surface between the ground control points and your image coordinates, and it's doing simple polynomial type operations between the two. The more in important, interesting thing that's relevant for us for um, uh, this exercise is this uh, geocoding using geolocation arrays. What does 0 0.003 mean? This means the desired spacing of the output. So I want the output in Latlon space and I want the spacing to be 0 0.003 degrees because 4326 is Latlon. You specify the spacing in the units of the, of the coordinate system that you're using. If this were UTM, you'd probably use something that's like uh, 100 meters or 60 meters in the TR space. So all of that should be documented in the, in the, in the web page for GDAL work. Uh, again, I don't have uh, access to this uh, folder. I would uh, like someone to run these and hopefully numbers haven't changed uh, since I haven't been able to uh, test this on uh, since our lab yet. So in this case, yesterday, if you notice that the topo steps, we created pixel by pixel lat lawn and height files. We will be using the lat, 
LON files um, to directly go from radar space to geocoded space. And GDAL has a mechanism for that called geolocation arrays. Um, so first we will work with a very small data set, uh, subset, because we want these computations to be fast for this class. So we're only focusing around the town of Hilo, which is a nice urban target. Uh, and the way you create a radar geometry transformer is like you give the input file name, the lat file, lon file, and you bring in a GDAL transformer. Um, then we create the transformer for our particular subset. Uh, and then once you have the transformer, you can transform any point from lon space, lat lon space to, to pixel location. Um, and then you're able to um, uh, 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 and I think I have an example where I pull out part of the imagery, plot the imagery and plot the located point. I think the target location I was looking for is this. So if anyone's managed to uh, uh, run this, please share your screen. Uh, So I think I picked the end of a pier in Hilo. Yeah. So in this example, if you scroll up a little, I can tell you what exactly you're doing. So we, uh, just a little more, two, three more lines. Thank you. So we created the transformer using the lat and lon arrays. Then, uh, uh, yeah, scroll down. I think just before the plotting, I was just describing what is happening in that cell. just above the plot. So if you scroll down a little, sorry. Ooh, ah, yes. So this line, a cell that is labeled 26 in your screen, uh, 20, uh, and cell, the cell above it, basically. Ah, perfect. So first I'm creating a transformer with the Latin lawn arrays, then I'm inputting a known position. So I've taken this position. If you put this Latlan position on Google map, you will see that it's the tip of the Hilo pier. And I transform it using this transformer. And then the next, I plot the radar imagery. And then I plot the point we just determined using scatter plot on top. And you can see it's right at the edge of the pier. So if you are looking for say corner reflectors or no, a known target in an image, and you don't have any radar special tools to work with, uh, this is a really quick way of, uh, of going between uh, one space and the other, radar geometry space and, and the geocoded space. Um, uh, thanks, uh, John was super useful. So good to know that this example still works out of the box. Uh, just to let you know, can you see my screen? I took in the exact lat lawn that we plugged in and I put it on Google Maps and that's the point we were looking at. And that's exactly the point that uh, 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 John showed in his example. So, um, okay. Uh, if you want to geocode a full image, uh, here this utility was to do individual pixel. It's flipped, that's correct. That's because we are loading the dot .rdr product and the location and location zero and location one represents the line and the pixel number in radar geometry. So you're doing the mapping in, in radar geometry in this example. And this is, a, this is of course, Google Maps. Everything is not, not 
uh, southeast-west aligned. Um, and then you could also build a, a full geocoding uh, yourself without having to use ICE geocoding. For example, if you want to geocode it in UTM or Polar Stereo, this is essentially what we do uh, when working with the Cryosphere community. We have a simple geocoding function like what's shown here. Um, and run this, and you can say geocode using GDAL warp, and then you can pull up the geocoded data. So if anybody's managed to run this, uh, volunteer to share the screen. Uh, this will run reasonably quickly. We are only doing a small subset, but if you're doing this over a fairly large image, this will take some time because it reads pixel by pixel that long values to do the mapping. So if anyone's gotten the geocoding to work, Nice, so that plot should be comparable to your Google map plot because now it's not south and east-west aligned. 